Thank you, everybody. As we announced the merger with Sea Electric, we received a lot of incoming questions and support for the transaction. We really appreciate that. We wanted to take a little bit of a step and share with you some of the answers to the questions that are coming in on our website so that we can help shareholders to really understand and feel the excitement that we feel around the deal. There's also a lot of questions that we can't answer. As a publicly traded company, there's a lot that we can't answer through our live streams or through personal emails or through other personal connections. All of the material for the deal can be found on the website or you can go to CDAR and look up what you'd like on that site. Everything has been filed that we know of today. And so I'm gonna go ahead and just jump into, you know, three or four different questions that are really key to the transaction. First question that we got a lot on is around, what does this mean from a dilution perspective for our shareholders? So Daryl, can you talk a little bit about what that means? So whenever you are issuing shares from a transaction perspective to purchase another company, you know, there's questions around dilution. You know, first of all, Extra standalone in 2024 was approximately a 200 million market cap company and analyst census had us between 40 and $50 dollars of revenue. We're effectively purchasing Sea Electric for 400 million Canadian and on a pro forma basis, we'll be north of $200 million of revenue in 2024. So it's a very accretive transaction from a multiple perspective and a trading multiple perspective. So if you were a retail shareholder that owned 10,000 shares prior to announcing the merger, you still own 10,000 shares, but instead of 10,000 shares in a $200 million company, you have 10,000 shares in a 600 million market cap company today. So what this ultimately means is that you have a smaller piece of what's potentially a much bigger pie, which is more pie at the end of the day. And so we believe that doing this transaction really unlocks a lot of more upside as Sue would have highlighted and Tony highlighted through the presentation. This is what customers are ultimately wanting. This is what the large customers are wanting. So we are able to scale the business into what we believe will ultimately create much more shareholder value for that 10,000 shares that you own today versus a month ago. In one of the questions we were asked around, what was the process that we got to, to deciding that Sea Electric was the best path forward for Exro? And how are we making sure that this is the best deal if now in the documentation, it shows that we can't go look for other deals. So I'm just gonna have Daryl talk us through the process, what that means now and how we got to this point today. I think what's important for shareholders to recognize, well, you only found out about the transaction on January 30th. We've been evaluating courses of action for the company for uh, more than six months. And so at the end of Q3 of last year, we engaged with our, our banking partners to look at a number of alternatives. How do we finance the company through to profitability, which you're always evaluating? You know, what are potential M&A opportunities out there to accelerate the business at the right time? And we also set up a special committee of our board at that particular time to evaluate these opportunities. So we looked at a number of different avenues to ultimately unlock shareholder value. We went through a very detailed process to evaluate each of those opportunities as standalone financing, strategic financings, you know, capital raises, debt raises, uh, things of that nature, and various M&A opportunities that you know, look for synergies in the business to accelerate that path to profitability. In the end, we did land on Sea Electric as being, you know, the most complementary across all of those boxes that we that we looked at. And from a shareholder perspective, we really see this being not only a great short-term option, but really locking in our long-term upside for shareholders. So the technology synergies that come to the table, the operational synergies and that path to profitability that's backed by major blue chip OEMs. That really locks us in for 2024 and 2025. And then at the end of the day, we are a technology company, but investors are focused on, you know, that path to profitability and we're set to deliver on that and then be able to unlock our technology innovations with Eric and team and Joe and team on the C side. We've got a lot of great innovations in the hopper, but the key is delivering that path to profitability and then focusing on the years ahead with a very differentiated business model and a strong technology platform. So one of the other questions that we, we've gotten a lot in, in the last week is around Extro's NDA partnerships. And Sue, so now that we've done or announced the, the merger, 
Does that take away from any of the NDA partners that we've been working with? What I want shareholders to know is that this wasn't a reactive decision. This was a proactive decision. There's no issues with any of our current partners. There's no issues with any of our NDA partners. All of the technology is progressing as we thought. Over the past year, we progressed. We were able to get in-vehicle, on-road validation of our technology with HB4 in Italy, with Geofony in Brazil, with VMC in the US and Canada, with C Electric in December with the F-59 truck. These were mon monumental milestones for XRO and our technology. We continue to develop, we continue to work through that. And now we have the advantage of working with multiple blue chip OEMs to introduce our technology and see the difference we can make with a coil driver. So Sue, one of the other questions that have come in, obviously we live in, in a social digital world now. So you can see when people update LinkedIn profiles and things of that nature, that we've gone through, like every company, some attrition over the last couple of months. Do you wanna clear any air for shareholders on that front? Yeah, definitely. So I wanna clear up again, there's nothing with the technology that is causing people to leave the company. I wanna clear up that when people have left the company, it's been because Extro is evolving as a company and we've made difficult choices to move on. Either we needed a different skill set, a different level of accountability, or a different set of leadership. And I think that what's important for shareholders and what you ultimately want to know is that the programs that we're working on and the progression of the tech and our commercial contracts are not being affected. And that I can quite confidently tell you, we haven't had any material disruption to the business with some of the departures. They were ones that we had planned on, ones that we were prepared for, and the companies continued on track as we committed to. One of the other questions that we got in from shareholders was, with the merger of C-Electric and, and XRO, is this a shift in XRO strategy? That's a really interesting question. So it's definitely not a shift in our strategy. If anything, it's accelerating our strategy. It aligns to the five-year roadmap that was agreed upon with our board of directors over a year ago. It's painted on our wall <laughs> in our headquarters in Calgary. The 24 would be our ramp up year. 23 was our launch year, which we completed. We launched our first production. We launched and we were able to work out kinks in our manufacturing to make sure that our supply chain was locked in. And now we're able to ramp up and continue our growth. This was complementary and an acceleration to our five-year plan.